When a government decides to bypass formalities in order to sell weapons secretly for strategic or political reasons, it's called the gray market. Armed diplomacy has various possibilities. That is, you're going to have armed diplomacy by lowering your requirements regarding human rights. And the key to regional stability will be arming the states. You have armed diplomacy consisting of equipping an actor who is a non-state actor with arms, sometimes to fight against a belligerent state. That's another kind of armed diplomacy. And we saw it very often during the Cold War. The USA armed anti-communist guerrillas in South America. In fact, arms are just provided, with the danger that they might be used for human rights violations or might be redistributed. This is what happened around 20 years ago in Croatia, at the gates of Europe. Miho Bokorica is a former Croatian soldier. He was responsible for the intelligence service in the Dubrovnik region during the war against Serbia from 1990 to 1995. In 1990, the country proclaimed its independence and elected Franjo Tudjman president of the new republic. The state, the second Yugoslavia, had a big autonomy in weapons production. In short, we had all the weapons we needed because we were self-sufficient in terms of arms production. The situation didn't last because the Serbs had literally emptied weapon stocks in the Croatian territory to take them back to Serbia. The Croatian invasion had been carefully prepared. The contenders for independence found themselves unarmed against a modern, well-equipped army. We bought whatever we could. Weapons arrived from everywhere, even from Serbia. That the Serbs sold their weapons to the Croatians to fight their own army seems unbelievable. But it's a classic battlefield move. For example, French, American and English weapons were used against coalition forces during the Gulf War. The fact that business comes first is as shocking as it seems. But it was fortunate for the Croatians, because weapons started to flow. Uh, we received weapons by all means from numerous countries, and it was done by all possible and conceivable ways from the emigrated diaspora from Canada, Argentina, and other countries. We bought weapons from whoever wanted to sell. We bought good and bad ones, because we needed to survive. Even today, you'll never know the truth about the origin of these weapons. A mixture of black market and parallel diplomacy. In reality, it was because as a state, we had not had a legal diplomacy and we had no weapons. We were helped by a hidden diplomacy from Croats around the world who used different networks to send us the weapons. None of these arms existed officially, and for good reason, it was secret. They had bypassed the usual authorizations and checks. It's also the case for all clandestine deliveries that a government will make to a group of insurgents or to a government that's fighting them, depending on the strategy of the moment. If a state uh, sends weapons to another state, um, even if it is in form of a donation, the expectation would be that the receiving state keeps the arms under certain control. Um, when the weapons are not directed to states but to insurgent groups, then we start having other types of problems. Um, and if these are groups that are in countries that are under arms embargo, then we have again another type of, of problem, of course. In this kind of situation, governments are directly involved. Embargo countries defy international sanctions and continue to stock up. The only way to get a hint about the trafficking is to look at seizures. 
In 2016, a ship from North Korea was intercepted with 24,384 anti-tank weapon parts and 4,616 parts to build rocket launchers on board. The ship was en route to Egypt. In the same year, in Saudi Arabia, more than 5,000 Kalashnikovs were seized as well as ground air missiles, mortars, and tons of munitions bound for Yemen. Authorities suspect that Iran was behind the trafficking. Weapons are a kind of merchandise that's highly strategic for a country. And given this, some countries don't hesitate to operate illegally, much to the benefit of dealers. We're talking about thousands of weapons. To organize all this, you need experts, intermediaries with loads of contacts. Among the most famous, Victor Bout, played by Nicolas Cage in the film Lord of War. His technique? Falsify the end user certificates. The end user certificates have very often been diverted, have been subject to trafficking, and have allowed an illicit arms trade to be organized. Like the case of Victor Boot in Sierra Leone and Liberia, where conflict brought suffering to the countries, he and his men used false end user certificates. They went to see the country from which they were going to purchase the weapons, and they said, Here's the end user certificate. Weapons are for this country. It's guaranteed for this use and for these actors. The problem is that the country who supposedly provided the end user certificate was not aware of this purchase. Apart from the traffickers, no one knows what happens to these weapons. They feed the fighters as long as the conflicts last. The question that no one seems to be asking is, what happens to the weapons when peace returns? <laughs> 